Last time I was up here, I went a little long. I've heard that preachers should only go for 20, 30 minutes. However, if across the entire year, it averages out to that, you're a-okay. So I went for about an hour, so I got to go now. Um, I just got to even sit down. Someone trying to stand up and get out of here. That was a quick joke. I appreciate the laughter. It's low-hanging fruit, so thank you. <sighs> the disciple John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's who I'm talking about this morning. You might have noticed that my name is John. Not a coincidence. I was actually named after John the disciple. Um, it, was, it was the bane that I had in middle school and high school, though, because people kept assuming that my name was Jonathan. Like, I had, wasn't that funny? I had, <laughs> I had so many people that would be like, uh, what's that, is it Jonathan? Or they call me Johnny or like anything else. And um, I didn't used to be funny. I know, it's hard to believe. Uh, but I used to be really serious all the time and get really, really mad all the time. And, and that was one of the things that would just infuriate me. Because I was like, my name is John. No, it's not Johnny. No, it's not Jonathan. It's John. And then I come to Pine Castle. And I got a pastor that loves names. And so they always get it right. And I love it. And Pastor Scott's been such a blessing to, to serve with. <clears throat> so to honor him, I just wanted to let you know what the name John means. Because words do matter. Uh, any fans of, uh, before I get into this, Star Trek in here? Any fans? So I was like 20 almost. Okay. Nice. I thought I was going to be talking to, like, these people. <laughs> there's, a, there's a scene in Next Generation, which is one of the television shows, where Data, who is an android, all right, he, he's, he's a, a robot that's been built, and he's talking to another character, and with her accent is, is part of it, but she calls him Data, but his name is Data. That's what he, when he was created, he was given the name Data. Also, very creative name for a robot, Data. Anyway, so she says data a few times. And at one point, he goes, data. And she goes, pardon? Data. Excuse me? My name is data. You said data. And she goes, what's the difference? And he goes, one is my name. The other is not. <laughs> I love it. One is my name, the other is not. That's so matter of fact, it's exactly what you expect out of a robot. But the core truth is still there. One is my name, the other is not. And names are powerful. God changes the names of people all the time to illustrate changes in their character. One of the greatest examples of that would be Saul when he became Paul after the events of Acts chapter 9. So the name John means God has shown grace. You know what I love about that name? Is my wife. Her name is Hannah. Does anyone know what the name Hannah means? The grace of God. You know what her parents didn't know? That that's what that name meant? And so they gave her a middle name and her middle name is Grace. <laughs> and so, so her name literally is Grace Grace. And that's like my nickname for her. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love that my name means God has shown gr grace, excuse me, and that I ended up 19 years later meeting someone whose name means grace. One of the most wonderful people I've, I've ever had the privilege of getting to know, my wife. But we're not talking about me. We're talking about John the Disciple, and I want to talk to you about the idea of honoring and respecting God. Christ? What does it mean to be reverent? What does it mean to honor him? I love how, how Sandra put it for, for our children. What does it mean to be awestruck by Jesus? You know, when I was in high school, I'm going to date myself, but not, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you when I was in high school. But when I was in high school, there were these t-shirts that were really popular, and I wanted one really bad, and, and I almost just made it myself because I couldn't actually find where to buy it. 
anywhere. And so I, I went to like uh, some, some print shops in town and got quotes because I was just like, I was in high school, I didn't have a job and my family was, was dirt poor by every definition of the word. So I didn't have $20 to go buy a shirt that was fancy with graphics and words on it. But I really wanted this shirt and I'm kind of glad I never got it. It, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a shirt for Christians, and, it, and it, it was really popular, okay, really popular. So many people I knew had it, and it just said, Jesus is my homeboy. And I was like, I grew up in the ghetto. I can get down with that. I actually wanted to revise it slightly, and I wanted my shirt to say, Jesus is my home skillet. Most of y'all didn't grow up in the ghetto, Okay. But that's what I wanted, right? I loved that. I loved the idea of, man, Jesus is my homeboy. Let's go. You know, my ride or die. I loved that and, and just the, the silliness of it and, and the, the humor of it. And it brought me joy. And, and I'm reminded that I have a sense of humor and, and I was made in the image of God. And so hopefully humor isn't sinful, but in fact, God himself can laugh. And I, and I don't think that there's anything inherently sinful about that shirt. But when I say I'm glad I didn't get it, here's why. The one thing I want to make sure I never, ever, ever do is treat my relationship with Christ flippantly. I want to make sure that I honor him and I'm giving him the reverence he deserves. And so I want to talk to you about John the Disciple because I want to talk to you about someone who, if anyone in the Bible was going to get a shirt that says, Jesus is my homeboy, it's going to be John the disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved. For years, I always chuckled when I read the disciple whom Jesus loved, because it's only in the gospel of John, and John wrote it about himself, and none of the other gospels call John the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's just every time he talks about himself, well, it's five times in particular, and I'll, I'll show you where they are. John is like, hey, by the way, there's Peter. Oddly enough, Peter is there all but one time. There's Peter, and then the disciple whom Jesus loved. I don't know if, if John and, and Peter had a bit of a feud or what, but it was almost every time it was the two of them together. It was Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved, like casting some serious shade on Peter a little bit, right? So if anyone is going to, to have the right, a lot of us, we, we say that we considered uh, John the disciple to be Jesus' best friend, right? If anyone has the right to say, Jesus is my homeboy, it's going to be John the disciple. So we're going we're gonna to walk through the disciple whom Jesus loved very quickly. Uh, if you want to get those slides ready. We're not going to read through all these references because we got a lot. Of we're going to read a couple chapters of the Bible this morning. So I hope you all are ready to hear God's word. Um, but this section, I'm going to just encourage you to make some notations. They're in your notes. Feel free to go back and read later. I'm just going to give you a brief overview because otherwise... I don't know, man. I feel like y'all are going to get rabid and hungry in like 20 minutes, and then I'm going to fear for my life. So there's five instances in the Gospel of John where John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. If you're into biblical numerology at all, you might think that five is the number of grace, and John's name means God has shown grace. What a nice, cool coincidence. Is it? Is it not? I don't know. John 13. It's up there on the screen. It is. Almost. It is. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yay. This is when Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, is going through everything. Actually, this is before he was betrayed. Sorry. I'm sorry, God. This is when, this is when uh, Jesus is telling the disciples he's going to be betrayed. Okay. And, and, and John is leaning up on Jesus. It literally says he's leaning against him. He's, he's resting on Jesus. None of the other disciples are resting on Jesus, by the way. Right? They're all at the table, and, and John is snuggled up on Christ. And I love that, because how many of the guys in here, don't raise your hands, it'll embarrass you, how many of the guys in here would never even hug another guy, let alone hold his hand, or rest on him during a meal? Because it would make you uncomfortable. And yet, here is John with Christ. Comfortable being close to him. Got really quiet. I'm going to move on. 
In John 13, Peter tells John after Jesus says, I want to be betrayed. Peter looks to John, or the disciple whom Jesus loved, and says, hey, ask Jesus who he means. We're curious. (laughs) We're curious who he means. The next one is in uh, John 18 when Peter denies Christ. Doesn't really look too good for, for Peter so far. John 19 is the crucifixion of Christ. When John is standing next to Jesus' mother and it says Jesus looks down and he sees Mary, his mother, uh, then he sees Mary Magdalene, then he sees the disciple whom Jesus loved. And this is right before he dies when he says uh, to her, look after my mom, bro. Look after my mom. Take care of her. And, and uh, just a few moments later, he gets a, a drink of vinegar from the sponge and then he yields his spirit In John 21, there's two instances. The first one is in verse 7. And this is where Peter and John are fishing, as many men do when they are backslidden. They're fishing. It took a second. It got there. But then what happens? All these fish show up out of nowhere. Jesus performs a miracle. And that's where Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved go, that's Jesus. It, revelation pops in their head. And then it happens again about 15 verses later in John 21, 15 through 25. And this is again, Peter is there. This is the, this is the section where Jesus asks Peter over and over and over again, do you love me? And every time Peter says, you know that I love you, Jesus responds with a command, feed my sheep is one of them. There's, there's a lot of scholarly work that's been done to try and explain or define or figure out why necessarily Jesus asked Peter three times. Some of the highfalutin theology is talking about the importance of the number three. Uh, some of it talks about how uh, uh, in just Hebrew culture, if you do something three times, it adds to the seriousness of it. We've, we've heard about that even from the pulpit before, right? When we read in scripture, like, verily, verily, I say to you, or truly, truly, it means, hey, pay attention. I'm not just saying this honestly. I'm being really honest, and you really need to listen. But then three times is reserved for God alone in heaven, in the throne room, when everyone's singing, they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's not just because the the syllables lined up just right to make a good song. It's because doing it three times in a row gave it an impact that nothing else in the Bible is awarded. Only time three words are in in a row like that. Holy, holy, holy. Similarly, people will apply that to, to Jesus asking Peter this. And I think these are all true, and I think... Jesus, the greatest communicator of us all, is capable of layering meaning into what he's talking about. However, sometimes I just like to simplify things because it's hard for me to understand otherwise. Maybe he was just like, you know what? You denied me three times. We're going to fix that right now. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then, and then what does he do? Builds his church on the rock of Peter. Peter denied Christ three times. Glory, hallelujah. That was, I thought the rapture was about to start. <laughs> I was ready. <laughs> How perfect for a pastor to be raptured on Sunday morning. I mean, come on. Uh, hopefully none of y'all will be left over in the pews. We'll get to that later, though. So, so Peter denies Christ three times. And then Jesus gives him an opportunity three times to reaffirm his commitment to him. And then Peter launches into ministry. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And and, and that is the love that John recognized. And honestly, I think that's why Peter was there almost every single time. The crucifixion, kind of awkward to show up to the crucifixion of a guy you claim you don't know. Right, so, so John involved Peter in all those instances. Why? Because Peter, even though he, he in some sense betrayed Christ, but, but really betrayed himself by denying Christ, 
Peter might have ran from God, but he didn't run from the man of God because he was repentant, because he was sorry because he hated that he had done that, because he desperately wanted a second chance. Praise God, we serve a God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and and a hundredth chances. God's chances never run out until the day you die. But if you wait that long, it's, it's too late. But until you die, Chance after chance after chance after chance. And so, so John recognizes this love right there, actually. I love that. All of the disciples in the stained glass glory of this sanctuary, and we got Peter and John next to each other, nearly inseparable. In Scripture, they're always around each other, even though they weren't the brothers. James and John were the brothers, but if any of you have brothers, you might recognize maybe why. John hung out with Peter instead. <laughs> Someone who, who denied Christ three times in a row, just bam, bam, bam. Jesus comes back. First thing he does, hey, Peter, let's talk. Come to Jesus moment. You know what we're not going to talk about? You denying me. You know what we are going to talk about? Right now, do you love me? I love it. Jesus didn't rake him through the mud. He didn't, he didn't lambast him over and over again. He didn't give him the, the, the right hand of fellowship. What did he do? No, he, he extended grace to Peter. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Fantastic. There's a common saying that, uh, actually, before I get to that, I should probably tell you point number one, which I believe was on the screen since I should have said that before anything else. Uh, John recognized that he was loved is point number one. John recognized that he was loved. That's why he said he was the disciple whom Jesus loved, not because he was special, but because he recognized that Jesus loved him. And so before we show the second point, it's not there, okay, cool. Don't jump ahead or anything, y'all. You'll spoil everything. And you know what the Bible says about spoilers? Nothing, but it should. So, so there is this, uh, this, this uh, I almost said this verse, <laughs> which is horrible because it's the exact opposite. There's this uh, uh, phrase that I heard my, my childhood all the time uh, in my family, outside of my family, and, and it, it became ingrained in me. It's probably familiar to you. Please don't amen it because I'm about to tear it apart and I don't want you to feel embarrassed. Um, it's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. Don't put it up yet. It's backwards for a reason. It's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. That is earthly wisdom. It's better to live a life of defiance than a life of submission. It's better to live a life of fighting for what's right instead of bowing down in obedience. And I embraced this for years. You might have seen the big yellow flags with a snake, don't tread on me. First of all, snake is the image of Satan, so maybe don't associate yourself with it too much. But secondly, our entire lives as Christians are supposed to be lives on our knees. They are supposed to be lives of submission. They're supposed to be lives of obedience and not defiance. This this truth hit me really, really hard when I was in college, in the middle of a worship service. I have no idea why God chose this moment, probably because I was unarmed and just not thinking about it, and so he knew that he could kind of get me. In the middle of worship, that phrase, it's better to, 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 to die on your feet than to live on your knees popped into my head, and immediately afterwards, there's very few times in my life where I will, I will say or claim that maybe God spoke to me, and I believe this is one of them, where he said, you know, John, it's okay to live on your knees if you're kneeling to me. And I was just, oh boy, oh no. And it hit me, it hit me so hard. It hit me so hard that right there in church, in the middle of worship, I took a knee. As I worshiped 
my Savior. Because I had realized that I was so focused on living on my feet and being willing to die on my feet. I was so focused on defiance. I was so focused on not being submitted that my entire spiritual self wasn't submitting itself to God. Because I was so focused on not being submissive. I was missing the entire point of my relationship with Christ, and that is submission to Christ. John recognized that God loved him. John recognized, it's in, it's in John 15, where Jesus says, I call you friends. We are friends, but we are friends by the grace and the choice of Christ. So why do I think that John got this? Revelation 1. We're going to read the whole chapter, because I love context. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants, or slaves, the things which must, must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priests, to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. <laughs> Just reminds me of the song Days of Elijah. This is kind of my jam. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. This is Jesus. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in the book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Theatra and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow. And her, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I stood. When I saw him, I said, bro, what's up? When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. If anyone in Scripture has the right to say, Jesus is my homeboy, it's John the disciple, whom when he saw Jesus fell on his face and cried, in his presence. Michelle and David, if you could set the table. So I contend to you that the proper saying should be that it's better to live on our knees than to die on our feet. And that's point number two. Better to live on our knees than to die on our feet. That's why we got the nice little knee pads over here. I mean, I don't know, you, you don't have to put your knees on it. You can put your forehead on it, but it's up to you. If you want to, you can lie prostrate at the altar. That's what John did before Christ. You guys hear me this morning? Do you, do you understand this? Am I making sense? 
sometimes I, I don't know. There's a lot, of, a lot of times in my life where I have treated my relationship with Christ a little flippantly. There's a lot of times in my life that I have uh, forgotten exactly what his sacrifice on that big piece of wood cost. And uh, before we close this morning, there's a couple things I want to do. One, we're going to talk about what happens when you recognize and accept that Jesus loves you. We're going to talk about one of my favorite passages. For most of my life was my favorite passage, and that's Psalm 23. Now it's like a top three. It's still really good. I'm going to talk about that a little bit this morning before we leave. And then at the very end, we're going to take communion. But before we do that, I'm going to I'm going to give you an opportunity, if you haven't yet, to put your faith in Christ. Because I want you to experience what I experience. The love of a father poured out for you is, is indescribable. So when I say that we need to revere Christ, I'm not saying, ugh, everything is so serious. Look, if any of the pastors in this church are the least serious, well, it might be Pastor Brian. <laughs> But I'm a close number two. <laughs> I'm a close number two. I think, I think I laugh more during his sermons than I do in most stand-up routines. He, he brings joy into the church, and, and we are so blessed to have him with us. Psalm 23. I've got a menorah here. If that makes you uncomfortable, you should probably read a little bit more of the Bible since the Jews are God's chosen people. But uh, I, I am uh, not by faith a, a, a follower of Judaism. I'm a Christian. But ethnically, um, one of the, the, the highest amounts of, of ethnic background I have, aside from Native American, is uh, Jew. And so every year in some way, I celebrate and honor Hanukkah. I celebrate and honor what, what God has done and is continuing to do. And so we're not going to light the menorah because Hanukkah doesn't begin for like a week and I don't want to grieve the Lord in some way. <laughs> but I want it there as, as a reminder that we were grafted into the body of Jews. We don't replace them. <laughs> America is not God's chosen country. We're not, Americans aren't God's chosen people, right? It's the Jews and Israel. That's where Armageddon's going to take place. Like, you can go there and look at the fields where it's going to happen. It's crazy to think about it. And so I'm not going to go deeper into Revelation for the same reason Scott didn't last week. It's confusing, and I don't have time, and I probably right now do not have the wisdom to do so. But... We're going to talk about Psalm 23 for a little bit. Greg, would you come up? Everyone give a hand for Greg Numbers, our church administrator. An awesome man of God. An awesome man of God. I'm very blessed to call him friend, colleague, coworker, all the above. Greg, if you would have a seat at the table. Okay, good. So what is this table well, for that, we have to go to Psalm 23, which is in your notes. And it's up on the screen in just a moment, I'm sure. Well, I just walked towards where my Bible isn't. I'm just going to read it from the screen. <clears throat> By the way, don't have my glasses this morning, so I'm going to get really close to you, David. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He lied, lied, leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Continuing on. Even though I walk through the darkest valley or the valley of the shadow of death, depending on your translation, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Greg, are you hungry? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, the table is empty currently. But God's <laughs> table is not. So uh, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you want to go back to the last slide, we're going to sit there for a moment. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Well, we got a table. 
Greg is the one going through the, the valley of the shadow of death. Sorry, Greg. But you got a table, and you're sitting at a table, right? I'm the stand-in for God, but please don't. There's no, like, theological reason why I'm the... It's just easier because I have a mic. Okay. I need five volunteers. Just, just jump up. The spryest people in the room. We got one. Oh, come on, people. I just, you don't have to say anything. All right, two, three, four, five. All right, all right. Y'all come down to the stage. Thank you. Please welcome our volunteers. Yes, please grab the signs. What's that? Well, I hope you all feel welcomed. I think about three people clapped for you. <laughs> there we go. There we go. You know, I was in speech and debate when I was in high school. And in high school, our speech and debate team, on the back of the shirt, it said that... Uh, uh, the fear of public speaking is the greatest fear among Americans today, higher than the fear of death, which means the average person at a funeral would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. <laughs> That's why we clap when people come up on stage, because this might be terrifying for them. All right. So uh, pick a card, any card. <laughs> I'm going to do a magic trick. <laughs> Here you go. Pick a card. And then which one you guys want? This one? Oh, perfect. Okay. So y'all just, you can, you can look, at your, look at your signs. Don't show the audience just yet. Uh, now, how many of you think that the things on those signs are nice? Probably not. It doesn't say I'm going to prepare a table for you in the presence of like your BFFs, your best friends forever, presence of your enemies. So here's, here's what I want you guys to do. I'm going to get out of your way and... Uh, just one by one, let's, let's think of what some enemies might be. So go ahead, and, go ahead and turn your sign around. Fear and self-doubt. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you in your life have felt fear or self-doubt? Sure. Tom? Insecurity and hopelessness. So far, I'm four for four. Maybe not today, but I've felt all of them. Hannah? Anger and bitterness. Yep, definitely. Six out of six for me. Depression and self-loathing. Eight out of eight, this ain't looking good. Patrick, last sign. Pride and arrogance, 10 for 10. Guilty of all the above. And yet I stand before you. Not a perfect man, but a man who has been through his fair share of valleys. And every time, God is faithful. And so here's what I love about this passage. It says he prepares the table for you in the presence of your enemies. They don't get to leave. And you can still see them. Greg, do you see Patrick? Yeah, yeah. pride and arrogance. Would you say that defines Patrick? <laughs> that was close. I almost got him. Almost got him. You see anger and bitterness? Yeah, yeah. So you see insecurity and hopelessness? Fear and self-doubt? Depression and self So you see them. Right? So here, here's the part that I didn't tell you. I want all of you guys to just start yelling. Now keep it PG because we're in the house of God. But just, just for a few seconds, I want, I want the, the entire church, they're not mic'd, so it shouldn't deafen you. And if you're watching at home, it may be a little less impactful, but you might pick some of it up. But I want all of you, for about five, ten seconds, I'll give you a big sign to stop. I just want you to start yelling at Greg so that we can... <laughs> Man, she was so ready. Hannah! Do, do I need to pull up a chair? Do we need to, like, I used to be in HR. Do we need to mediate? I mean, we can mediate if you want me to. Are you okay? Yes. Okay. Um, can I get a ride home from somebody? <laughs> all right. So um, I, want, I want all of us to, to remember what it's like when we're surrounded by our enemies and they can yell at us, right? We get the still, small voice of God, but the voice of the enemy is usually like a, like a just horrid, horrid earthquake. So, uh, yeah, just start screaming at him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Best line of the day goes to Tom Radowski. What about that? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Here's the thing. Y'all don't get to leave because what happens in the middle of all of that suddenly, how many of you ever saw, um, was it Get Smart? That cone of silence that drops down? I want you to imagine for a second that happens right here at this table. They're still there, and they don't get to leave. 
in the presence of your enemies, God specifically says, I'm going to prepare a table for you, Greg. And your enemies, these things inside your head or the demons that have been oppressing you or the people that have been coming against you, they have to watch. They have to watch something that they don't get to participate in. They have to watch something that they can't interfere with. They have, to, they have to sit there and watch you have a meal with your father. And they're powerless. He doesn't want them to leave. Why? Because God wants to remind your enemies where they're going. And it's not going to be with him. The lies, the self-doubt, the, the fear, the anger, the bitterness, the depression, the self-loathing. These things are going to be burned away from us. There's two seats in heaven, the judgment seat of Christ, the one that we want, and the great white throne, the one we definitely don't want. The great white throne is the one that says, well, you're going to the bad place. The judgment seat of Christ is the one where Christ holds our lives up to his holy flame and burns away everything that is not profitable. And then we enter into his presence forever. It's a good thing. It's a reminder that all of these things, every single one of them, are going to be burned away. None of them will be with us for eternity. Hallelujah. Praise God. Feast in the presence of your enemies. And then he anoints your head with oil, and he fills your cup. Now, I decided to go the less messy route and I appreciate having the tablecloth because I considered it, but for the sake of time, I won't. And that is, when I do this demonstration, sometimes I like to, here you go, take, take your cup, you know, there's, there's, it's empty, you're fine. But if it wasn't empty, I would start pouring. You know like the Olive Garden people when they start doing the Parmesan? And I'll be like, hey, just say when, Greg, you know, just say when. You know? And I'll just, I'll ignore him. Whenever he says when, it'll start spilling out and going everywhere, and it's really dramatic and gets a lot of laughs. But one of the things that, that I want to say before we break into communion, before we end this illustration, when your cup overflows, when it's spilling out and draining onto the table and onto the floor, when God is filling you up more than you could ever, ever hold yourself, I want to encourage you not to let it splash onto the floor. Find people whose cups are not full. Position yourself in their life so that as God pours into you and the extra bits run off, it runs off into their cups. Be people who are fountains of God's grace and give it to everyone they encounter. Does anyone in here not want to be an overflowing cup? Good. That's great. Thank you. You, you, guys can, you guys can sit down. Greg, thank you so much. You, you're, you're dismissed as well. Um, give everyone, uh, uh, everyone give them a hand for our lovely volunteers. Give a second hand for my beautiful wife. Thank you, thank you. I, I married so far up, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so we're about to go into communion. If, you, uh, if you've never taken communion before, we'll talk about it. But before we do, I want to give you an opportunity. If anyone here has never given their life to Christ... If you've been through valleys of shadows of death and you haven't experienced the respite, if you haven't experienced the, the break that comes with feasting with God, if you're going through life and you just don't feel the love of God, which is palpable, I want you to know I've been there. I've talked about it from this stage many times, how close I came to not being here anymore. I don't want you to go through that for another single day. I don't want you to suffer 
needlessly and alone? Because you're not alone. God is with you. And so I want to give you an opportunity if, if you've never prayed to receive Christ. You're welcome to this morning. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer. It's not about me. It's not about the people next to you. And as a matter of fact, to illustrate that, I want everyone to say the words with me. Now, you don't, if you're saved, you're not going to get bonus points for saying it again. Right? You don't need to get baptized 13 times. You don't need to say the sinner's prayer a million times. But what we're doing right now by saying it is we are being in community with each other. We are encouraging the people among us who might be hearing a little bit of lie from Satan saying, don't worry about it, do it on the way home. Don't want that. And so I'm going to pray, and I want everyone to say it with me. And if you're praying this for the first time, and if you've never accepted Christ into your heart until today, come and see me or any of the pastors after service. Not going to throw your name all over the place. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you show up next week in like a toga to get baptized or something. I just want to share with you the greatest hope I have ever found. So we're going to pray and then we're going to take communion and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, I love you. This would be when you say it back. I recognize that I am a sinner. And Lord, I recognize that you died on the cross for me. And Lord, I know that you didn't stay dead. I'm sorry for the mistakes that I have made. From today forward, I yield myself to you. Enter my life and become the Lord of my life. Thank you for your sacrifice. And thank you for your resurrection. Amen painless. It's the exact opposite, actually. It's like an ointment or a salve that kind of eases the wounds. I had a, uh, a video clip I was originally going to play. We're not going to run it. I'm going to save it for another sermon because I don't want to interrupt this moment. It's a beautiful moment. When you enter the sanctuary, you should have gotten a little tiny thing of communion. If you didn't, we have some ushers that have cups. So if you don't have one and your neighbor doesn't have an extra, feel free to raise your hand, get a cup of communion. We're going to take that. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he turned to his disciples and he said a lot of things. But one of the things he said, as he, he picked up this, this piece of bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take it. Eat of it. And as often as you do this, remember me. So, that's what we do. And then he picked up a, a goblet of wine. It, maybe it looked like this, right here. And he said, in this glass is my blood that was shared for you. In it you find life, restoration, healing, hope, sanctification. Drink this 
And as often as you do, remember me. So we partake. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We give you the rest of our lives. We give you the rest of our weeks. We give you the rest of today. We give you the next 30 minutes as we drive home. Help us to be fountains of grace. Help us to recognize that you love us. Help us to to fall on our knees when it's appropriate before you give you the glory. We love you, Lord. I pray for your hope and your light and your life to shine in and through each of us here this morning so that we can be an encouragement and a reflection of you here on earth. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand for a benediction? As we go out this morning, It's still the morning, (laughs) barely. As we go out this morning, and you go to lunch, you go to hang out with your families, everything else, I want you to remember today that God loves you in spite of you. That he showed his great love for us in this, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that is what we just remembered through communion. So now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you blameless and faultless before his great throne of mercy, the only wise God, our Savior, be all power and glory and majesty and reign forever and ever. Amen. Go, be blessed. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday.